Let's start talking about the teams. We're going to get them on your screens in just a second, but let's start talking about Jug to begin with. They are probably a community favorite, I think it's safe to say, and possibly a favorite in the tournament as well maybe the teams i would say are like very close but yes if i have to pick a favorite sort of that would be jack and they are really noble guys really great just beloved by the community and a lot of people are cheering for them and i think they want to answer those cheering and i think they they will do a great job of doing that and harry their opponents forza uh, being a newly formed team effectively you know merging the two teams you've been across in teams yourself it's, it's a. Uh, there's always sometimes that honeymoon period where things just go so well and you start picking up great results, or you could have that slow burner stage and it takes a while to get going. This is the issue they're going to have now because you've got to remember with those two teams, it's only recently they've joined together. Like you mentioned, the honeymoon period it can last a couple of weeks, could last a month, could last three months, or it could just not last at all. It's just one of those situations where they won't know till on the day. But both those teams were only 15 points separating from fourth and fifth. So if they've combined the best players of both squads, we could see something really interesting to give Knights of Honor a huge challenge. They might have that big step up. Well, you've heard what we have to say about the teams. That's why what they've got to say themselves. First up, it is going to be Jug, aka Knights of Honor. And here are the players for Jug lined up, ready for action. On your left side, it will be Ilos. Alongside him is T-Mac, Dobar, and Jani Stanis. These guys, they have been dominating the scene. They are very popular faces in the scene, very friendly faces yeah. in the scene as well. But they did look very determined in that video, <laughs> I'd <say>. menacing. Yeah. <laughs> They're promising like a hard fight to <laughs> anybody who is going to stand in their way. Harry, I mean, this, this is this is obviously coming onto the stage. You know, this is this is all new, as you just mentioned at the start. You know, sometimes, often these guys will meet each other for the first time. They may have been together on Discord and chatting about the game and uh, playing together for a, a number of months, maybe together. But this will be the first time they've met each other. They've been here for a couple of days now. They've had a, a media day. They've sort of edge themselves into the the esports world effectively but now they're sat on a stage with stage lights on them with cameras on them they're just in a walking with spotlights on them the nerves have got to be building of course i'm hoping the chemistry between this team now is something else you've got to remember that it's the same for knights of honor as well so one thing i want to pick up on is the fact that on the last go for final uh, knights of honor actually came third they were very consistent in the previous uh, go fours but this time i think in terms of momentum i think it's more the morale for them the fact that they didn't have such a great place in it, the last one will it affect them i'm not sure but for the uh, i'll try our team as well with forza it's going to make you wonder really this is their chance to actually capitalize on that morality of Knights of Honor. And something we should say, obviously, these guys, you know, pretty much every team here has played each other. They've all won and lost against each other as well. So there's no clear favorite. I think it's safe to say everybody can beat everyone on their day. It's who can turn up here in this LAN environment, Stannis. I'd say that in the top teams, uh, each team has a personal relationship with the other top teams because they have been meeting up uh, a lot of times, a lot of times, and even before any esports was even happening, these teams are core players. Our like the guys have been with us from the start, most mm. of all of, of all of them. So I feel they'll have a they'll have a really personal, really <laughs> personal score here. <laughs> well, they've embraced it. That is Jug Knight Savannah. Let's meet their opponents. That is going to be Forza. Forza, the very first esports team to dip its toe in the waters of Guns of Boom. Expect to see many more to follow. Big organization stepping in there, of course. Expert alongside Spasm, 
Привет, Андрю, Каргата, привет, Райт. I've got a lot of Russian comrades and spiders. <laughs> and Houston, not such a Russian name after all at the end. <laughs> but uh, these guys, we were talking about it, right? They've merged effectively the two sister teams together that would have been playing uh, alongside each other. You mentioned at the start, Harry, they, you know, just 15 points apart. So perhaps uh, finger picking the best from both worlds effectively as an organization steps in saying we can only take four of you. No, that's absolutely right. One thing you've got to take into account is the fact that if they've got the best slayers from all both of those teams, you know, they could be a force to be reckoned with. They could actually be the underdog or even a powerhouse. And it's like I mentioned before, with Knights of Honor, you know, they're a little bit consistent towards the end. So this is the chance now for Forza to capitalize on that, make that, you know, make that stance for that first match and actually continue through that winner's bracket. We should probably get across to the guys at home. We do use a bit of lingo in the esports terminology, slayers, <laughs> fraggers, basically the guys that get the highest kills. That's what it's all about, Stannis, right? Yeah, it's true. I'm really curious what kind of energy Forza brings today uh, to this stage with all of those issues that we talked about and mm. with all of the with all of the maybe possible uh, uh, advantage of picking the best players. Uh, I'm really interested how they're going to play together and what is going to happen in the end. Well, I can tell you we did have these guys. So there is a map pool for this uh, tournament. Uh, we have three King of the Hill maps, three Camp Control Point maps and uh, three Team Deathmatch. Now, They've had a veto system, which means they were able to ban away a map individually. So we get down to the last three remaining. So the last three maps were uh, Atrium, which we're going to be starting on, which I believe was uh, Forza's choice. Uh, then on to Wild West Saloon. So a bit of, bit of King of the Hill in there as well. And then finally on to uh, the Farming Complex. So two Control maps and one King of the Hill. Let's talk about that to start with. Obviously, the bans, a lot of TDM being banned away, so clearly neither of these teams want to be part of the TDM. Uh, but control points, it brings its own mechanic to it, right, Stannis? Yes, of course. Uh, the control points mechanics, uh, they favor the team play more than the solo uh, aces, the fraggers, the slayers. Uh, so the control points uh, as a pick means that both teams are feeling very comfortable with their team play and they believe they're going to be able to coordinate well. And the TDMs are really good when you have a well, you have a ha have a good day and you have a good ace and then you'll just keep on piling on kills. So I think it might say something about how these teams, uh, what kind of tactic they're going to use. And Harry, obviously you've taken part in other FPS titles, but you've still had control point king of the hill in there. Uh, where do you see this going? Obviously it's all about a getting that point first off. But do you go passive? Do you go aggressive? Sort of which which sort of start? Especially bear in mind it's the first game of the day. Yes, it's extremely difficult to actually comprehend because we're going to with King in the Hill. There's two ways you can go about it. You can either try and be really passive, wait for your opponents to make the first mistake, and then once you get one or two down, you can straight away start making a contestion, and then you can get them on spawn from there. Or you could be the aggressor. You can make them make the first mistake. Very, very risky, but like we always said before, high risk, high reward. So if there's any opportunity to actually take advantage of that, and of course that's great, but it's like I uh, mentioned, it's the first time I've seen a King in the Hill game type in about 10 years, so I'm extremely happy to see it back, especially in Guns of Boom, and to see it all pans out. It's one of those ones that always just falls away. It's always been there in games. It just falls away in the eSports side. It always goes towards control points, which I'm great to see. We're going to add all, all three varieties. That's what I love to see. Um, so these guys, obviously, they did have bands. Um, what is your theorizing? Uh, the theorizing? That's the word I'm after. Uh, easy for me to say as an English speaker, you're a Russian. <laughs> and, uh, um, what, what is the theory? They're obviously taking away TDM, just don't want to play that mode to start with, because obviously that TDM can be very different. It's all about getting the piling up the skill, kills, getting your doubles, your triples, your, your, your quads, and maybe even the, wiping everyone out and just getting a crazy score. Um, obviously a lot of ways to score in this. Do you feel it's just they, they don't want to risk it early on? Because I, I was looking at the bands and basically, uh, yeah, EU Square, Street, Subway Station, so they were, they were removing most of the TDM maps right at the start. Mm. Well, I agree that's a good piece of theorizing, mm. but I think it's that... It's what it's all about, theorizing. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, think that, I think that maybe they want to mm, test out the opponent. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I think that the risk-taking uh, risk is uh, somewhat in control yeah. points, too, that the team death matches, they tend to be really, really close. So you can uh, keep wave after wave after wave. You just 
uh, keep taking it back and making comebacks. So it's a lot more nerve-wracking. But with uh, uh, King of the Hill especially, uh, usually when you get the points rolling, when you get the point and you defend it one time, it's basically it. So You, you can keep control. That's, that's literally what it's all about. They call it control point for a reason. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the first game is ready to go. Let's get over to your cast. It is going to be Jackie and Mustard. Thank you very much, guys. Now, uh, almost immediately, I know we're twins and everything, but my name is Ketchup. I can hear guys laughing in the background. I'm laughing inside, but I'm going to try really hard not to. Thank you very much for joining me, and obviously Jackie on the desk as well. It's a pleasure. How are you feeling about the first matchup? I'm excited. I think it actually should be a, a good affair to delve my toes into with Guns of Boom. I'm in the right place to kick it off, right? I mean, the biggest event the game's had, and it looks You could stunning. say the best. You could say it's definitely the best setting to have. Now, I think kicking things off uh, with Jug Knights of Honor is a great opportunity, I think, for you guys to see, I think, what the high level of Guns of Boom really looks like. I know there's going to be a lot of people in the chat that you guys may be playing the game, but you may never have seen it in this competitive setting. And to really kind of reiterate and go into a little bit of a mini history lesson, Jug Knights of Honor have gone into this Invitational as the strongest team. So I think there are a lot of people here that are expecting to really kind of see them in maybe minimum grand final situation. But Atrium, personally, it definitely excites me because this was not in the rotation throughout the GoFor Cups. You know, the bi-weekly Cups we were doing where these teams were playing for a big change every couple of weeks. We did not see this map whatsoever. So in a competitive setting, this is one of the first times we've seen it outside of community tournaments. So things could be a little bit more spicy here as well, is basically what you're alluding to, catch up The fact that really going into this, it's a little bit of an unknown quantity. For these teams as well, how much practice they're going to have on that are really, you know, especially a LAN environment, your first real LAN you're walking into, you've got the spotlight on you. It's about performing on the day. They need to step up massively. Could this throw a little bit of a curveball in, Vic? I think that's maybe even why we've seen it first. Um, if you do the regular matchmaking, you're going to bump into this map a lot. But that said, throughout our community tournaments that we have been doing, I think, you know, these guys are going to be used to things like Wild West. They're going to be used to Europe Street. They're going to be used to the, you know, the subway. You know, we would see them on a really consistent basis. But we're going to kick things off. This is our very first match of the Guns of Boom European Invitational. And we're going to be checking out T-Mac first. Now, we do have the ability to check out the first person perspective at this what LAN. But that said, as it's control point, we're still going to see a lot of that third person. Yeah, obviously centered around how important that control point is. There was a big early frag coming in with a HE as the nade did a ton of damage. They are trying to get control of A as well now, catch up as they make their mark and try and set things up with a nice early basis. A big lead coming in. Now, they may have taken out TDM from the rotation, but that doesn't really change their ability to score the kills really impressively uh, when it comes to Jug. They are able to win the fights almost every single time. You see a lot of blue on red uh, when we check out the kill feed on the top right. And that's because if they can win the fights, they win the point. If they can take these 2v2s and maintain control the entire time. As you can already see, the early lead they've been able to uh, sort of really build up here. That said, we did see somewhat of a turn of momentum, but is it going to be enough? Oh no, they're actually taking the lead. How about that? Before I can even finish speaking. Yeah, crazy stuff. Jug, though, still attempting to come back into it. They do want to gain control of that A-bomb site. A little bit of a flank coming in as well from Expert. Is he going to be an expert on this one? Tries to get the early tag. Unfortunately, goes down, but the suicide nade at the end does deal the damage. I do actually think that's still going to be an Expert frag because you're able to at least get the trade, right? If you're in that yeah. 1v1 and you can't survive, just go for that Hail Mary grenade toss. It's such a common strategy and it works really well. Uh, that said, we can see Expert and Houston doing that two-man attack. Privet's able to fight back a little bit. And you can see every time a kill lands, there's some sort of bonus added to it. That's because if you get a headshot, if you get a double kill, everything you do in this game has a little bit of extra weight and it does give you a little bit of extra points. That killing spree that we just saw Privet get will give them a massive point injection. Yeah, those 15 extra points are going to be just juicy on helping them start to get themselves into oh. a dominant lead. Nice snipe as well. The headshot to boot catch up. He's feeling himself. I think I would be after that one as well. The Barracuda, such a constantly use sniper rifle in the game because if it's passive, get one of those kills the headshot and it will regenerate a bullet back into the magazine. So running out of ammo basically doesn't exist if you're godlike, which Team Mac was able to score one as well. Johnny getting a juicy double. Unfortunately, it's taken out by Houston, but the double kill is going to contribute anyway. And I feel like it has been a steady lead for Jug in this first map. Yeah, they've just been able to keep adding to it, especially just how easy they've had in terms of mobility. They're roaming around the map. They're being able to keep B to their site pretty much the entire time. They've had a good defense over the A site. They're playing it smart, but this could be a bit of a resurgence. They are about 200 points behind. They need to do something crazy. And as you can see, they don't have long left. No, they definitely don't. And the thing is, if they're able to go down, they at least do damage. I think that's why Jug are somewhat winning these fights anyway, because if they go down, they can damage people enough that when they respawn, they're basically dealing with a team that has half HP left, which means the cleanup is very, very easy to do. And I think that's why there's been a constant 200 point lead. That early lead that Jug were able to get has basically carried over the entire time. 
Oh, absolutely giving it. Stanislin there. Nice double. Can they try and build from this? T-Mac is in the background. Comes in with just a single frag. Illus is going to be able to add to that expert to try and punish, but it looks like things are all said and done here. This should be a victory for Jug, as that is going to be a smooth pickup. And there it is. And we actually heard some popping off in yeah. the background there. And I think that's because these players know how important this event is. You know, they've been playing constantly almost every single week because the go-fors. But this is the first time they've been in this massive offline setting. You know, you're surrounded by your teammates. You understand that if you win this tournament, you're getting sent to America directly. You know, the hard bit is going to be done from that point. And uh, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of those celebrations after each map. But that was a level of dominance I think we kind of expected to see. That said, Forza were able to somewhat start to climb things back a little bit. Unfortunately, in a typical way with Guns of Boom, it can sometimes be too little too late. If you get a really good start and you can't really recover, even if you start doing well at the end, I think the damage has already been done like four minutes ago. Yeah, that's very true. It's also the fact as well, more so for Knights of Honor, you could see very good teamwork there and their understanding. Roaming around, working as a unit, playing with a buddy system. They were able to keep uh, defense over the majority of those control points and keep themselves into a very good position where even though Forza were finding the frags and started to get a little bit of momentum, they just physically didn't have that extra bit of oomph and that could be because you know they're in their infancy it's a newer roster you've combined two squads together and it might take some time for that to come through really now one thing to take away from that first map was yes it was a dominant beginning for jug but i think that forza did a wonderful job of being able to sort of climb back up on that ladder even if they did it too late if they can kind of keep that level of play going fresh into the second map, I think that they're gonna, obviously going to have a better chance. But that's what interests me here, is that there is no team deathmatch mm -hmm. in this rotation. So it's going to be entirely around the team play. That said, control points is where map control is the most important. When we go over into King of the Hill, which is going to be our second map on the Wild West Saloon, that's where the frags really start to ramp up because just we didn't really talk about it much because obviously we didn't have a lot of time with it being straight into the map yeah but those that may be wondering what the kind of like random fluctuation of points is it basically means that when you get a significant kill that is anything beyond a regular kill you get an extra point bonus and that is anything that's a headshot that's a knife kill that's a grenade kill it's a double triple team kill killing spree you name it you get an extra boost of points which means that if someone in your team is doing amazingly well it's not going to be just the kill difference that gives them the points it's going to be basically how stylish they're able to deliver it. And in King of the Hill, with one point to take, team fights become a lot more important. Yeah, they're going to be messy. It's also the fact as well, it's not only you that is going to get that benefit. The more frags you get, the more wild plays, the more finesse you're displaying, you're going to get a bounty on your head. And if someone can actually come in and punish you, that is going to be a huge bonus for the opposing team as well. So there's a lot to look out for. You've got to play smart, not only aggressive. You need to know when to fall back, when to go in. And King of the Hill is going to be the best environment for that, as you said. I definitely agree with that, because control points, I think the early snowball effect can, can start, which really enforces how important it is to get a good start in control points. But if you get a bad start in King of the Hill, the, the chance for a comeback becomes way more important. I actually believe we might be in our next map, and I think it is going to be correct. And just look at that. Oh We've God. had like five seconds and everyone's dead. Look at the difference in points as well, but the comeback's there. Dubo have a double to start to add towards it. So pretty close stuff. Both teams around 50 points at this time. They do need to fight over this point. It's all about it. Nice little tag coming through as Expert punishes one man. Now, the Porcupine is going to be the weapon of choice in King of the Hill. It really is the greatest up-close weapon in the game, causing enemies to catch fire for damage over time, massive damage output in itself, and if you're these players and you're incredibly accurate, those critical shots, those headshots, will do exponentially more damage on top of that. A wonderful turnaround with the grenade is going to be enough. No, T-Mac is able to win that one versus one. I lost on T-Mac, the two-man, make that three-man team. Privet Andre trying to go in with a bit of preemptive damage, but I feel like actually been able to catch them out a little bit. I was surprised they didn't really turn around and close in on it. Yeah, that's a huge what? flank. Look how many kills oh. he has got. Carrying on with just complete domination across the board. They try and gain that site control as well. This is where it's going to be tense. Trying to contest the site. Both teams going in. Finally, a triple comes through. And that is Janny that just makes such a difference before he's laid to rest by Stanison. And take a look at the top of the screen. That triple kill gave a wonderful points injection. And it's going to be making sure there is a star player on the team. If you can set people up, let your star player knock them down. Let those killing sprees come up. That's going to be a two-man attack right there. T-Mac gets one. Does he drop again? Or can he get some more of a triple? Not quite. The defense, obviously, defending the point gives you extra points as well. Nice turn around on the grenade, but it's not going to be enough. But just like that, I think a steady climb. Satan's able to get a triple, and again, that's really going to show how much points you can get from a great play. Unfortunately, it's not enough. Killing spree, that's going to put them just slightly behind. But there is significantly less points to play for as well. King of the Hill was 1,000, whereas control points was 1.2. 
as well from the multipliers that are starting to come into effect. The double nade bounds them out the server as they've been blown to complete bits. Chani trying to make it work for his side, but Expert has had enough of his messing about. Takes him down, Houston as well, annihilates T-Mac in the battle of the snipers. They've got that site control, and finally they've got a lead. And they're able to also stop Vilas from taking the point. And that's really important for them because they're getting so many of these unreturned frags. And now it's always 2v1, and T-Mac does manage to get a couple, so that's going to be a good little bit of points, but it's not going to be enough. Hang on a minute, a triple kill without a single ounce of damage and a quadra kill from T-Mac. That might have saved the game for them. That's the finesse we were talking about. Incredible stuff. He's been so useful as that versatile sniper, playing back from those further positions, getting big tags. It's not only the frags that matter, it's how much damage he's been outputting Ketchup. It's just completely lovely. Because even if you don't get a kill, if you're able to do the majority of the work and let your team finish the job. And another oh. triple kill. T-Mac is having an absolutely fire game. The killing spree and, I mean, in. That's a triple kill and then a killing spree. Look at the point difference. This man has single-handedly brought his team back into the fight soaring ahead over everyone else. He really has just been the hook, line, and sinker for the squad. Maybe there could be a little bit of a resurgence. Stason going to show exactly what he can do as well with three of his own. Hits him with a hat trick, trying to carry on as his team will just start to build with that momentum. And this is so much closer than what we saw with the first match. It was a wonderful fight for Stason because he got both a triple kill and a combo breaker. Taking out the most damaging player is going to give him even more points, but it might be a little bit too late. Have they been able to climb away and take the lead? I do think they've been able to get some of a little burst, but the steady lead for Jug has continued. And remember, guys, this is first to 1,000. So we are nearing the end of this King of the Hill. Yeah, these Rough Riders don't want nada of this as they're trying to punish and close it down. Hey, comes around from the corner, the nade, T-Mac. He knows how to lob him. And we are incredibly close now. I feel like one more significant kill, one more significant sequence is gonna really sort of put the nail in the coffin here. I think we might be at the point of no return with four left to go. And there it is. Just like that, they managed to take that 2-0. Look at the hype from these guys. Normally some players are reserved after a first game of the day. These guys, not so much. I think the thing is as well, for me personally, I think this is great. They've come in, they've sort of asserted their dominance. You know, you've got the early 2-0 victory. You're hyped up. You have to feed off that, especially in this LAN environment. You imagine for Forza, they're still trying to find their foot in. They've not had the best first run. When their opponents are screaming, Feeling that heat, that's going to leave you in a bit of a dark spot. And this is exactly what Jug want to show. They want to prove that they can be the top dogs. And I think that's the message you needed to send. Just to remember, you know, the, the victory did not go to Jug in the final go for that we had. That went to Yakuza. Mm. It was almost actually a complete swap of what the results normally are. So it was quite nice to be able to come into the setting and go, hang on a minute, guys, we're still here to play. But that doesn't mean that Forza, they're going to be very, very disappointed. You can actually see it in their faces right now. You know, body language is so important. That said, they're not out of this tournament. This being a double elimination bracket means that staying in the winner's bracket pretty much just gives you that added safety net. You know, it gives you that extra chance to survive. So now they're in the loser's bracket. They are now in elimination territory, but it's not over. That's the key factor here. That's very true. This is actually backing up our point as well with what we've seen from Forza. It's the fact that internally, in terms of their players, they're very effective damage dealers. They've all got very equal frags across the board. You can see the split for the side of Jug is actually a lot more stacked towards the top end. It was basically one man popping off, and we know exactly who that was. I think T-Mac, uh, this is not the first time we've seen T-Mac put in the work, for lack of a better term. Whenever we watch this guy play, he's almost always on fire. And for good reason, you know, if you're playing in this competitive setting and it is a fast and snappy responsive game, there's a lot of kind of hidden tech that you can do in Guns of Boom, you know, be it those like really quick, accurate, where to position your crosshair yeah. for the headshots, which we saw T-Mac get plenty of with both Porcupine and Barracuda, um, but also things like quick switching. You know, there's certain strategies where you can essentially set up your weapon order, double tap the screen and go to what you know you want next, but you have to set that weapon order up earlier in the fight. So there's a lot of predetermined calculation. But for now, that's everything from us on the commentary desk. I'm going to throw you back over to the analyst desk. Take it away, boys. Thank you very much, and apologies for mixing you up with your brother. I know why I haven't said it. I think it's all, all the discussion and the <laughs> hubbub that's been going on. But anyway, let's talk about the game. A quick, snappy 2-0 to zero there for, I would say, the guys that we expected to be the favourites coming into this tournament. They did qualify in first place. They were the highest point scorer. We weren't sure how Force were going to uh, respond to that. Very close second game, no doubt about it. First game, very much one-sided which, in fairness, was Jug's map. It was their choice. Second map, very, very close on Wild West. But T-Mac, just as Forza just took the lead, turned it on. 
Yeah, it's just crazy stuff because I was a little bit worried for him at one stage because you saw the, in terms of the lead and how things were going, they were falling quite behind. He had to pull something out. And literally that Kodra kill, the killing spree, as you know, it adds so much additional points coming into this game. But one of the things I did really notice the fact that uh, with the Knights of Honor team, they did abuse that high ground. So with the Casino and Saloon sign, you could see that it will back up and forth just to try and at least get something going. But delayed the hill enough so that it made Forza a much harder challenge to even contest that hill in any way. Yeah, Sane, it's obviously, uh, you know, we can talk about T-Mac, it's just all about his, uh, with the scope, I might add, as well, which uh, obviously we saw a lot of shotguns early on, you got to get in, got to get bruising, got to get that point capture, but then from range, the shotgun, uh, the scope, he got himself the double, or line in one bullet. It was amazing. Yeah, it's actually extremely dynamic, and I felt like uh, from the first game, it was, yes, it was complete domination, but it really felt like Forza was getting their footing and that they were having a real chance at victory, and T-Mac just completely undercut that. So he somehow, I suppose, overcome uh, all of the nerves and just destroyed them. And that's uh, uh, an interesting thing in Guns of Boom. It's a very very comeback prone game that you can uh, take so many points by yourself and you can completely change the flow of the game so if you are uh, if you are strong enough even though Forza was putting up quite a fight they were uh, I felt like they were actually even working better as a team on this King of the Hill map but that didn't matter because they couldn't uh, they just couldn't uh, see uh, T-Mac and his uh, extremely well sniping yeah, I and mean, we saw here, obviously, you can see the scores, just, just how close it was throughout. The Porcupine obviously used up up close and personal. And then teams basically started to, as you mentioned, started to use that high ground, use the distance a little bit more. And you just felt they started to get grips. That was where uh, Forza had just took a lead for a brief moment there. And then T-Mac happened. That was literally the story of that game, wasn't it, in all fairness? When he was in the mid-map, he noticed that with a couple of his teammates, he's already made them quite weak. He had some of them coming back and forth, baiting and switching around the vending machine and the piano area. And when he did notice something like that, T-Mac had the opportunity to, when he had the call-outs, he went straight in, cleaned everyone up, and he knew that if he got that quadra kill and the killing spree, he can easily overtake that lead and just continue on from there. But fantastic geometry abuse on that entire map. Yeah, and that's what it's all about, finding the weak points of your opponent, found it, Absolutely executed it and took himself a very easy 2-0 to zero there for Jug, aka Knights of Honor. Fantastic start. That was the first semi-final. That means Knights of Honor are going to be moving through to the winner bracket. Of course, Forza will drop down to the loser bracket, but that's not all. We're going to have more matches coming up after the break. It's going to be back-to-back -back up against Yakuza. We'll see you then.